So I'm going to be reading part three of My People Shall Live. First, I'm just going to put some crowdfund posts in the replies. So if you just give me a couple minutes, it won't take long. And we'll get started shortly. I'll also put the previous chapters in the Jumbotron. So in that way, if anyone wants to catch up or share, they can. It won't take long at all. One of the things I'm putting in the replies as well as crowdfund posts is fundraisers for Sudan as they're going through horrible, horrible circumstances there imposed by the West. Ways to help would be to donate to certain fundraisers that they have collected at the grassroots. So that's also in the replies. Okay, I got a few crowdfund posts in the replies as well as ways to help people in Sudan with fundraisers that the grassroots have collected and made accessible. So now I'm going to put the PDF of the book um, that we the jungle trunk. And if I sound really relaxed, it's because I'm under the blanket. I'm freezing out here, but in a good way, it's comfortable. All right, so the PDF is in the Jumbotron as well as the thread with the parts one and two. So that's up there. And All right, so I'm on page 42. This is part two says the declaration of a new humanity, resistance and revolution. The road to Hayafa. Hayafa was seized by the Zionists and converted into a European city. It is an extension of Europe's decadence and dehumanization. Hayafa cannot be recovered by special prayers to Mose Dayan. It can only be negated by the birth of a new Palestine, Jewish and Arab, Abu Salim. The Arab masses had for over a dozen years pinned their hopes on Nasir to liberate them from Zionism and from their local oppressors. In 1967, after the June tornado, Nasirism laid in shambles. As Mose Dayan sat in his office waiting for a telephone call from Cairo expressing Nasir's desire to sign an enduring peace treaty with Israel, the apologists of Nasirism and Baathism were explaining their defeat in terms of negligence, overconfidence, poor generalship. Instead of underlining the real reasons for Israel's stunning victory, decadent Arab social order, corrupt social classes, incompetent leadership. Meanwhile, the Zionists interpreted their victory as a sign of divine grace and choice, the victory of racial superiority and Western technology, a proclamation of Sabara morale and social cohesiveness. Yet, for reasons not understood by the imperialist forces, Nazir did moral and social. I'm sorry, Nazir did not make the expected call to Dayan. He had to desire to capitulate, and had to be done so to the Egyptian people would have burnt him at the stake. Mm. Indeed, no Arab leader, however reactionary would dare to make peace with Dion or any other Zionist bully in the future unless he were totally suicidal. Hold on real quick. I want to make sure the sound is good and not choppy. So hopefully y'all can hear me. Let's see. The Palestinian people, however, made a call to Dion, but it was a call of bombs in broad daylight. The Palestinians had entered the picture as a decisive social force. We decided to make our own history, to speak for ourselves, to seize our own destiny. No sooner had we arrived on the scene, however, 
than the Egyptians and Americans, the Israelis and Russians, the Gaulists and Britons, and all the forces of quote unquote peace coalesced and resolved to stamp us out. On the eve of the June war, it appeared to those outside the halls of power that the US and the Soviet Union were on a collision course. To those in the know, however, something very different was happening. Here is Lester Velie's inside account from Countdown in the Holy Land. The quote goes, for three years and nine months, the line, that line between the Kremlin and the White House, had remained blessedly quiet, carrying only test messages and New Year's Day greetings. Then Monday morning, June 5th, came the electrifying news that Moscow had activated it seriously for the first time, but the message was a reassuring one. The Soviet Union would keep hands off the Middle East war, provided the U.S. did the same. In a cautiously worded reply, Johnson agreed. Mr. Johnson's cautiously worded reply was a simple way of keeping his options flexible. He was assured by the CIA, Pentagon, and State Department officers that Israel would win within four days. Had these calculations gone wrong, however, there was no doubt that the U.S. would have intervened. According to Veli, whose source is the State Department and Pentagon, it was morally and practically inconceivable that the U.S. would not intervene. Israel is one of the few democracies in all Asia and the Middle East. Since the world regards the U.S. as Israel's protector, whether the U.S. wishes to be or not, Israel's destruction with Soviet help while the U.S. stood idly by, would send tremors of fear throughout the non-communist world. Further, if Israel went down, no other pro-Western nations in the Middle East would be safe from Nazir and the Russians. If the decision of the two superpowers not to intervene had been taken on June 5th, and they seemed to be on a collision rather than a collision course, what then was the value of the verbal combat at the U.N.? And why was the special emergency session of the General Assembly called by the Soviet Union? The verbal exchange at the UN had only psychological impact as both powers resumed rearming their respective clients instantaneously. On June 19, 1967, Koizgen, leading a high-powered Soviet delegation at the UN, condemned Israel as an aggressor demanded that Israel withdraw to the June 4th borders and urged the UN to make Israel pay reparations for damages inflicted on the Arabs. One hour before Kosi Gin delivered his speech, President Johnson outlined, outlined the American position on the Middle East before the National Foreign Policy Conference for Educators in Washington. Here are the five great principles of peace which were in fact which were, in effect, the substantive points of the even rebuttal to Mr. Koizgen's speech at the UN. The five points emphasize the right to life of all the nations in the area, justice for the refugee, respect for maritime rights, and filing of reports by all UN members' nations on their armed ships to the Middle East, respect for political independence, and territorial integrity based on peace. The last point, also advised adequate recognition of the special interest of three great religions in the holy places of Jerusalem. I'm certain that if a comparison were made between what Johnson said on Washington and Ebon said at the UN, it would reveal systemic collaboration between their coterie of writers, if not collective authorship of the two speeches. By that as it may, be that as it may, however, the crucial point to remember here is that the speeches of both reflected the viewpoint of the victor. It is obvious why most of the dwarf states at the UN, African, Latin, and Asian, thought that Johnson and Ebon were, re were reasonable, impartial, and indeed magnanimous in victory. Since the Soviets were at, on the side of the vanquished and had substituted propaganda for collective action with the Arabs, there was no other course of action they could adopt. Both participants and spectators refused to take note of the following. A. All UN spokesmen who purported to speak for Palestine denied the Palestinian peoplehood and classified the Palestinians as refugees. B. 
be. They all regarded the conflict as being Arab governments versus a Jewish state, as opposed to the conception of the conflict as being Arab versus Zionist and opposed versus, I'm sorry, oppressed versus imperialist oppressors. C. They all prescribed some kind of regional political solution between existing political entities instead of instead of the creation of a new social order where Arab and Jew could be self-determining within the framework of a unified Arab socialist republic. Therefore, by definition, all states proposed solutions that had to be rejected by the Palestinians with alarm. Every solution that presupposed the continued existence of the Zionist state in our midst was antithetical to the Arab social revolution. The deafening verbal blast at the UN only concealed the political chinery that vanquished except a ceasefire. The vanquished accepted a ceasefire on the basis of the accomplished military conquest. The UN passed no resolution demanding Israel, Israeli withdrawal. It merely established observer groups on both sides of the Suez Canal, and the Israelis settled down to building Nabus, a Nabal's paramilitary colonies, and Kubitsum, sorry, I'm not sure how to say that, all over the area referred to firstly as conquered, then administered zones, and now liberated territories. The Soviets and Americans returned to the regular autumn session of the General Assembly and delivered more bombast, reiterated their previous positions, and presented the same resolutions. The Arab diplomats talked as if, as if they were the conqueror and demanded complete Israeli withdrawal. They invoked the principles of Western morality and justice, not realizing that those, were, those very principles were the very ones used to justify Zionist, quote-unquote, humanity towards the Arabs. Finally, with the agreement or acquiesc acquiescence of all concerned, the UN Security Council unanimously, unanimously passed its famous British resolution on November 22nd, 1967. Here is the preamble and the operative paragraphs of the resolution. Security Council expressing its continuing concern with the grave situation in the Middle East, emphasizing the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war and the need to work for, for a just and lasting peace in which every state in the area can live in security. Emphasizing further that all member states in their acceptance of the Charter of the United Nations have undertaken a commitment to act in accordance with the Article Z of the, char of the Charter. One, affirms that the fulfillment of charter principles requires the establishment of a just and lasting peace in the Middle East, which should include the application of both the following principles. Withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories of recent conflict. Termination of all claims or states of belligerency and respect for and acknowledge of the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of every state in the area and their right to live in peace within secure and recognized borders, boundaries free from threats or acts of force. Two, affirms further the necessity that A, for guaranteeing freedom of navigation through international waterways in the area, B, for achieving a just settlement of the refugee problem, C, for guaranteeing the territorial inviolability and political independence of every state in the area through measures including the establishment of demilitarized zones. Three, requests the Secretary General to designate a special representative to proceed to the Middle East to establish and maintain contacts with the states concerned in order to promote agreement and assist efforts to achieve a peaceful and accepted settlement in accordance with the provisions and principles in the resolution. Four, request the Secretary General to report to the Security Council on the progress of the efforts of the Special Representative as soon as possible. Resolution 242 obviously embodies the points proclaimed by Mr. Johnson in his speech of June 19th and includes the Soviet Arab demand of Israeli withdrawal without specification or insistence on total and immediate withdrawal. 
More importantly, however, while the resolution refers to the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war, it ipso facto sanctions Israeli conquest by offering to trade her conquest for quote unquote secure and recognized borders. Apologize, I got a call. By conferring on Israel as or and by conferring on Israel all the legitimate attributes of permanent and unchallenged statehood. Lastly, the resolution paternalistically alludes to a just settlement of the refugee problem as if we were some kind of environmental pollution that had to be grappled with, while the territorial inviolability and political independence of every state in the area are upheld and guaranteed. Western diplomats claimed the, that Resolution 242 represented a quote-unquote a solid gain of Western diplomacy and a serious reversal for the Soviet Union's Middle East policy. In an anti-climatic speech on November 23, 1967, President Nazir gave his response to the infamous Resolution 242. Nazir enumerated Egypt's war losses and disclosed that 80% of its military equipment was destroyed, that over 100,000 soldiers and 1,500 officers were killed, and more than 5,500 men were taken prisoner. Then, with all the strength he could muster, Nazir declared that he was stronger in November than he was in May of 1967. But his ambivalent but weak position was revealed by his implicit acceptance of 242, and he could merely argue that 242 was insufficient and unclear. The atmosphere at this time was bleak for me. I was uncertain and despondent. In the autumn, I returned to Kuwait and compared notes with my colleagues. Those who had been in the occupied territories were indignant and talked about the possibilities of armed struggle. Those who had visited elsewhere in the Arab world came back angered, frustrated, confused, and dismayed. Nothing changed the atmosphere drastically that autumn. With the approach of the new year, News of renewed batch, oh, I'm sorry, Fatah activity was filtering into Kuwait, and I was told in a hushed tone by a friend that the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine had been proclaimed in November. No other concrete information reached us regarding the PFLP. While I was in Lebanon during the summer, I was unable to make any direct contacts with my former associates outside of Sanwar. For a whole academic year, I was unaware of PFLP developments. And since the open A&M cells have been eliminated in 1965 to 66 in Kuwait, there was less opportunity to convert the A&M branch into PFLP cells. Although the transformation was being carried out in other parts of the Arab world, there was nothing else to do but to try and participate in Fatah activities. I did. At the outside, outset, most of the teachers who were politically inclined had no clear idea of what action to take. Nothing was happening as we settled into another monotonous year of teaching. We continued, as usual, our campaign of indoctrinating the students and discussing how Nazarism failed to unify and defend the Arab world. We focused on the latter point as a defensive posture against attacks on the Palestinians for causing the Egyptian debacle. It seemed then that the general public sympathized with President Nazir and felt that the easiest way of silencing the Palestinians was to use them as scapegoats. My colleagues and I didn't feel guilty. We merely went on the defensive. Later, we used the attacks as starting points to criticize not Nazir, but Nazirism. Fatah was the only revolutionary organization whose activities were tolerated in Kuwait. The PLO, although recognized as a legal Palestinian entity by the government, had neither leaders nor followers of any significant numbers. I myself had outgrown my original lukewarm sympathies for it and sought another outlet for my political energies. Fatah, having renewed its military operations on August 18, 1967, presented an opportunity and a challenge. Along with our principal and a handful of tears, 
I endeavored to work through Fatah to liberate Palestine. I have been raised in a good A&M tradition of question and debate. For every project we undertook, for every action we contemplated, for every view we held, the A&M had offered a rationale, a way of ascertaining and examining the facts, an opportunity to propose alternative programs. Fatah was something new in my experience. Our sole function was fundraising. We were not a part of a policy-making process, but merely spectators or ticket agents in the Temple of Fatah. Periodically, nebulous uh, lectures were given. Speakers always remained within the realm of glittering generalities in dealing with the strategy, ideology, financing, and recruiting of the movement. Initially, I thought it was impotent on my part to ask too many questions since I was a novice in Fatah's rankings. Then I decided that I, as a Palestinian, should know what we were doing to create a new Palestine. I began pressing for answers. To whom was the movement accountable? Why did it accept, why had it accepted funds from Saudi Arabia and other reactionary sources? What was the nature of Fatah's socio-economic program? Why had Fatah tried to isolate itself from the Arab masses? More importantly, I wanted to know what women could do beyond fundraising. Most of the, most of the answers were not forthcoming and those that were extremely inadequate. We were told that the movement was autonomous and its leaders must remain anonymous for security reasons. Fatah, as I learned later, was the most open secret in the world where the pseudonyms and the real names of the leaders were known to the whole world and the movement acted and operated in the open in Amman before the eyes of friends and foes. As to why funds were accepted from Saudi Arabia, my education commissar informed me that in the liberation stage, we must ally ourselves even with the devil in order to win. He insisted that only the Palestinians should be allowed to participate in the revolution. At that time, Fatah did not recruit or accept Arab recruits in its ranks, but later slightly modified the rule under pressure, as if the Arabs were a different race of people. Abu Ali was not convincing. He only increased my doubts. Yet, I continued to work through Fatah because I had no alternative. He often asked me why I was so troublesome and asked so many embarrassing questions. I always said, Abu Ali, we can't win unless we have a reasonably clear program and organized members. Besides, we must know the whole truth regarding the revolution, not only its slogans. By posing questions, I triggered off a chain of events that higher officials had to deal with. Friends and supporters of the movement were going uneasy because the relationship with Fatah was solely material not a relationship sustained by political interaction or participation in the political process. My message was getting through to my audience. I asked questions in a restrained manner and was too well known and too generous a, contrib a contributor to be dismissed as an unfriendly critic. But Todd had to provide the answers. A prominent person came to see me, Fathi Ararat, um, brother of Yazir, the leader of Fatah. He had a long talk and exchanged ideas. The most important point I raised was the question of women and their role in Fatah. I pleaded with him to let me join their military wing, Al Asifa, because I had been military trained for years. I was prepared to go on patrols and operations inside the occupied territories. He promised to see what he could do and report back to me. A month later, Fati asked me if I could go on, if I could go to Al Aguar on the Jordanian side of the River Jordan. I enthusiastically said yes and made plans. To this day, he has not returned to tell me when and where to report or whom to contact. Meanwhile, my fellow Fatiites in Kuwait were kind enough to find a role for me. They proposed that a group of us do something creative for the summer of 1968. They suggested we could perform two important tasks, assisting overworked mothers in the refugee camps and visiting the families of our martyrs. Social work, I scoffed, 
is not social revolution. I want to participate fully in the revolution. Such talk was eclipsed on March 21st when Fatah scored a historic first and the tide of Arab despondency began to ebb. It was the Battle of Karama, March 21st, 1968, the marking and undoing of Fatah. Again, I'm mispronouncing a lot of words, and if anyone knows the correct pronunciation, don't hesitate to correct me. I am open to learning. I'll continue. Karama was a Palestinian city on the east side of the River Jordan, created out of nothing but the Palestinians after 1948. It was a symbol of hope and dignity. The Israelis tried to liberate, liberate uh, Kama, oh, Karama and failed for the first time in their long string of military victories. There were trounced, I'm sorry, they were trounced in a psychological sense, but victorious if we measure the operation in strict military terms. It was a turning point, and the Arab news media inflated the incident to make it appear as if the liberation of Palestine was just around the corner. Thousands of volunteers poured in, gold was collected in kilos, arms came by the ton. Fatah, a movement of a few hundred semi-trained guerrillas, suddenly appeared to the Arabs like the Chinese Liberation Army on the eve of October 1948, I'm sorry, 49. Even King Hussein declared that he was a commando. The Arab-Palestinian masses felt that in a few months, Palestine was going to be recovered. The euphoric atmosphere gathered momentum as the Arab gov governments joined the chorus of Fatah adherents, supplying it with rockets, military transport, artillery, etc. They made the revolution affluent. The Arab governments needed Fatah as a shield to cover up their own incompetence. Fatah became a folk song, a fashion, a fetish. Its leaders, cadres, office clerks were regarded as saviors, saints, and seraphims. Fatah, with Yazir Arafat as its chairman, was flirting with the PLO. In July 1968, while Fatah and the PLO were playing hide-and-seek and enjoying the comfort of the Nile Hilton, three lonely revolutionaries performed a dramatic, history-making feat, which the new PLO denounced. The Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine seized an Al an El A airplane of the Israeli semi-military, semi-civilian airlines. The aircraft was taken to the Arab state of Algeria, and the later released the plane and the latter released the plane and passengers without insisting on exchanging them. Israel, the world Zionist conclave, the imperialists, the Arab states, and the PLO and co. all assailed the PFLP and accused it of air piracy. All of a sudden, Israel was able to count friends in progressive Arab circles. The incident was an eye-opener for me. It was the beginning of the end of my exile. I was about to be liberated. I had found an alternative to Fatah, and I sought to make contacts with the PF, the PFLP. Mm -hmm. oh, hold on real quick. Let me charge my phone. Sorry about that. Phone was about to die. Mm -mm. Okay. At about the same time, in a seemingly insignificant event, the YMCA American girl, Jane Marlowe, came to live at our house in Sour for a week. She was placed in our home because my younger sister, Kalita, had some relations with the YMCA and because most of us spoke English at home. Jane was a typical Yankee do-gooder who came to Sour to teach the quote-unquote refugees swimming, drawing, fun, and games. Jane, like most American missionaries who come to the Arab world, whatever the garb they wear was a pacifist who advocated peace among the Semitic brothers, thinking there was plenty of room for all of us in the region. We tried to tell her that the issue was not only territory, but imperialism and Zionism. Sorry, got a phone call. Uh... We tried to tell her that the issue was not only territory, but imperialism and Zionism, and whether the Arab and Jewish masses were going to determine that future for themselves 
or allow the vampires of American and Zionist high finance to determine it for them. Jane told us that the word vampire was a hyperbole and lectured us on the necessity of using analytical language rather than emotional-laden slogans. Mm. <sighs> Sounds so familiar. She was not as perceptive and well-informed as she claimed. In a few minutes, we discovered where her real liberal sympathies lay. She referred to Fatah as a terrorist organization that deliberately mined roads and killed Israeli schoolchildren. She showed how colorblind and profound she was by telling us that the Palestinians should live among their brothers in the Arab states and avoid being discriminated against in Israel. We smiled, seridonically, as Jane revealed her ignorance of the plight of the Palestinians. She was blissfully unaware that she was a spouting the Zionist line about the Palestinian problem and advocating the final solution that the Zionists proposed for our eternal peace. Jane had read her New York Times well and pontificated objectively on the need for peace and stability in the area. She was a Catholic girl from the Bronx who knew what was good for Arabs and Jews. <laughs> we heatedly debated both sides of Arab-Israeli conflict, in quotes, the morality of hijacking, the legitimacy of revolutionary violence. She was aware of the phantoms of her government supplied to Israel to maintain the balance of power, in quotes, in the Middle East. And she was opposed to the Zionist privilege of collecting tax-free dollars from America. But she saw all these things in terms of the arms race and Russia's expansionist policies. She did concede the right of the, oppo of the opposed, I'm sorry, of the oppressed to take up arms against their oppressor and saw the political value of hijacking, if not the morality. I explained to her that the Israelis held thousands of Arabs prisoners and threatened the lives of Palestinians daily. If she wanted to be impartial, ethical, she must pass moral judgments on the Israelis, not on us, because our actions were merely sporadic responses to a tyrannical social system. Although she remained liberal in her attitude, she posed some poignant questions that had a lasting impact on me. Are you a refugee, Layla? She asked me, or she said to me. Technically, yes. Emotionally, no, I replied. I am no longer a refugee because I am a revolutionary. She looked around her and surveyed our apartment building, then politely asked, excuse me, politely asked, do you expect to live in Palestine more luxuriously than you are living here, if and when you get there? Perhaps not, but that's not important, I answered. It is very important, she insisted, because you wouldn't give up what you have here and you're not doing anything personally to reach your goals. Jane stunned me. My mind went blank. I thought for a minute and admitted. Jane, you're right. I am only talking. I haven't done anything concrete. To calm myself, I went to the veranda, looked longingly southward to the mountains beyond, beyond in Palestine, and secretly promised to join in the struggle of my people. Jane was feeling triumphant as I returned inside. I spoke sorrowfully. The Palestinians are a hard-working people, but they are a dissipated people. A good many have educated themselves well, but so few, including the Khalid family, are doing anything to express their collective existence as a people. I looked at my younger brothers who had angrily attacked Jane for criticizing the El Ha hijacked and for being a Zionist. I said in English, the lady from America has been a good teacher. She has forced us to recognize and think about our obligations to our people. We ought not to be angry with her, but thank her for helping us expose ourselves to ourselves. We must act, not just talk and memorize the arguments against Zionism. My brothers, ashamed, withdrew from the room. Jane and I sat down for a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Before and during my association with Fatah, I had misgivings about its political and ideolo ideological attitudes. But it was the foreign operations of the PFLP, as well as Fatah's embrace of the PLO, which made me realize that Fatah was not the best Palestinian response to its enemies. I was finally convinced. 
when I heard heroic tales of the PFLP underground from my fellow teachers who have been in the occupied territories. I resolved that I must join the PFLP. The problem was how to contact their underground in Kuwait. One day, it happened by accident. I was passing by this, the South Arabian bookstore where a man was selling PFLP Christmas cards. I looked carefully at his cards, all the while trying to determine whether or not he was a member of the PFLP or just a friend. He wouldn't, com he wouldn't comment himself. I pleaded. I want to get in touch with the PFLP very badly, and I want to join. Believe me, I want to join. I am Palestinian. I want to fight. I want to go to the occupied territories. Please tell me, whom to see and or contact. Surely if you are a supporter of the PF, you'll help me. He listened to my plea and told me to return the following Thursday afternoon between three and four, and he introduced me to the local representative. I was overjoyed. I arrived two hours before the appointed time and waited inside the bookstore leafing through journals, pamphlets, and books of the Arab and international left. Precisely at three, a tall, handsome young man walked into the bookstore. He looked very solemn as he greeted the card salesman. I presumed he was the PF man. I introduced myself. He was reserved and courteous. I told him who I was and said I was anxious to join their military underground. He gave me a camaraderie pat on the shoulders and said, I regret to inform you, Layla, that you have to be educated first. Educated? I said as I drew away. I am a teacher. I know how to read and write and all that. No, Layla, I didn't mean educated in that sense. Abu Nadal said. You'll have to study the ideology and strategy of the PFLP and work with other comrades first. Then we will decide where your talents could best be put in the service of the revolution. I interrupted. I want to fight. I can't wait. And what do I need such a fancy language for anyway? Patiently, Abu Nadal explained. Layla, the liberation of Palestine is going to be a long, long struggle. You will have ample time to prove your prowess. Believe me, if you're capable of fighting and wish to fight, the PF will not hesitate to send you anywhere you're needed. I was cheered by his reassuring promise, but I wanted to make sure that I was not going to be left stranded. What should I do then? I asked. First of all, he said, you will have to spread the word at your place of work and from a study group to educate yourselves and undertake various projects to help the PF financially. Next week, we will meet here again and continue our discussion. We will get in touch with you if you forget to get in touch with us. I left the bookstore and went home at peace with myself. I felt I was on the road to Haifa. I was coming out of the abyss. The same evening, I contacted some of my close friends. We spent the whole night together, evaluating the political affiliation and commitment of each, of each teacher. We decided that we had a large number of sympathizers and could probably form a cell in a few weeks. From now, on, we met regularly every week, and I saw Abu Nadal periodically to obtain PF literature and advice. Abu N Nadal also put me in touch with some former comrades from the old A&M who had joined the PF. We were slowly building a PF network in Kuwait. The assault on the El Al plane on December 26, 1968 in Athens gave us a big push, especially after December 28th when the Israelis raided Beirut International Airport and destroyed 13 Middle East airplane, airline planes. We thanked the Israelis for enlisting Lebanese support for the revolution and admired their audacity in blowing up planes that were 70 to 80 percent American owned. From our vantage point, we were anxious to see the consequences. The world was at last forced to take notice of Palestinian actions. The air press couldn't ignore them nor could the Zionists conceal them. The Israelis had helped the, the cause more than we dared contemplate by their prompt and decisive, quote-unquote, reprisal. It seemed the more spectacular the action, the better the morale of our people. We looked forward to more. 
Here is the aim of the Palestinian Revolution as spelled out in the PF program. The Palestinian Liberation Movement is not racist or hostile to the Jews. It is not aimed at the Jewish people. Its aim is to break the Israeli military, political and economic entity, entity which is based on aggression, expansion, and organic unity with the interests of imperialism in our homeland. It is against it is against Zionism as a racist aggressive movement in alliance with imperialism. Zionism has capitalized on the suffering of the Jewish people to serve its interests and those of imperialism in this rich part of the world, which is the gateway to the countries of Africa and Asia. The aim of the Palestinian Liberation Movement is the establishment of a national democratic state in Palestine, in which the Arabs and Jews can live as equal citizens with regard to rights and duties, forming an integral part of the democratic, progressive Arab national existence which will live peacefully with all the progressive forces in the world. The Palestinian Liberation Movement is a progressive national movement against the forces of aggression and imperialism. The link between the interests of imperialism and the continued existence of Israel will make our war against the latter basically a war against imperialism. On the other hand, the link between the Palestinian Liberation Movement and the Arab Progressive Movement will make our war against Israel that of a hundred million Arabs in their national and unified struggle. The battle of Palestine today and all the objective circumstances surrounding it will make the war a starting point for the attainment of the interconnected aims of the Arab revolution. Lastly, the Palestinian war, as far as the Palestinian and Arab people are concerned, will lead to the civilization of the Arabs and the result in the transition of the Arab people from the state of underdevelopment to the requirements of modern life. Though our war of liberation, I'm sorry, through our war of liberation, we shall acquire facts, the habits of underdevelopment exemplified in surrender, dependence, independence, individuality, tribalism, laziness, anarchy, and ex. I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce this word to save my black ass life, will be changed through the war of liberation. In their place will come the realization of the value of time, organization, accuracy, objective thinking, acquisition of all its weapons and knowledge of the value of human being, the free of woman half of society from the bondage of decadent habits and customs, the basis of nationalism, in confronting dangers and the supremacy of this connection over tribalism and regionalism. Our long-term national war of liberation implies our fusion in a new way of life and our starting point on the road of progress and civilization. The enemy camp is defined as follows. One, the enemy of the Arabs in the war of liberation is Israel, Zionism, world imperialism, and Arab reaction. Two, the enemies has definite technolo technological superiority, which naturally is converted to military superiority and a great fighting force. Three, the enemy has long experience in opposing the people's development towards economic and political liberation. It has the ability to abort revolutions. Four, the nature of the war of liberation as far as the main military base of this enemy, Israel, is concerned, is a war of life or death, which the political and military leadership inside Israel will attempt to fight until the last breath, the National Front, and the forces that constitute the revolution. We will consider, or we consider Palestinian national unity as essential in the mobilization of the forces of the revolution to resist the enemy camp. On this basis, we should adopt a definite stand in this direction. Five, the former of national unity is the creation of a front in which all the classes of the revolution, re revolution workers, peasants, and petite bourgeoisie should be represented. We should attend actively to the mobilization of workers and peasants in one revolutionary political organization armed with the ideology of scientific socialism. On this basis, we should actively attempt to unify all the left-wing Palestinian organizations which, through dialogue between them and through their experience, 
can commit themselves to such an analysis. The petite bourgeoisie will not join an organization committed to scientific socialism and strong political organization. Thus, it will join those Palestinian organizations which raise general liberal slogans, avoid clarity in thinking and analysis of class structure, and exist in an organizational form that does not require of the petty bourgeoisie more than its capacity. In other words, the petite bourgeoisie will fill in the first place the ranks of Al Fatah and the Palestinian Liberation Organization. On this basis, and on the basis of our understanding of the basic conflict, the nature of the present phase and the necessity of national unity to assemble all the forces of the revolution to resist Israel, we should work for the establishment of a national front with Al Fatah and the PLO, which can offer the war of liberation the necessity the necess <laughs> the necessary whew, class of alliance on the one hand and protect the right of each class to view the war and plan for it in accordance with its class vision on the other. Our study group was rapidly, uh, our study group was rapidly mastering the strategy and ideology of the PF and moving towards the cell stage. On the advice of Abu Nadal, we were studying more advanced radical books and broadening our horizons when another Palestinian woman revolutionary made world headlines and shook our movement. The morning of February 18th was just another day for me. As usual, I got up at 5.30 a.m. to prepare breakfast and listen to the BBC news. Suddenly, I heard over the air the name of Amina de Habror. She had been in, in on an attack on an L plane at Zurich. She was the first woman to participate in a foreign operation. The news struck me like lightning. A Palestinian woman, a revolutionary, in a citadel of finance capitalism? Fortunately, the BBC announcers regularly repeated the major news items and read them over in detail for I wasn't certain at first whether I was hearing or imagining. I ran out in my pajamas, screaming throughout the dormitory. She did it. She did it. Palestine will be free. Everyone thought I had gone mad, but I made sure that everyone got the message. A Palestinian woman was fighting while we were talking in faraway Kuwait. Within a few minutes, we were all celebrating the liberation of Palestine and the liberation of women. Fatah and PF had earned its way to the El Shahab teaching of staff and their wallets. We decided that henceforth, all funds collected must be distributed equally between the Fatah and the PF. The Fatah sisters acquiesced. They had no choice. The school became a beehive for the resistance. Even the pupils were turned into revolutionary salesmen and fundraisers. We indoctrinated them so well that some of them turned out to be more effective supporters of the resistance than many of us. The same day, I called comrade Abu Nadal and informed him that I wanted to join the special operations squad. He agreed. From then on, I received advanced, highly specialized training. It was only now a matter of time until I participated in a foreign military operation. The hour of reckoning was drawing me closer. While I engaged in intensive training, I continued teaching and converting my study group into a tradition-breaking cell. In Kuwait, politics were forbidden, but six women decided to take career and reputation in the name of resistance. On an April morning, the Muslim, I'm sorry, the Muslim Easter, we marched to the center of Kuwait carrying PF collection boxes and requesting donations. At first, the other women were not enthusiastic. They were frightened. I was shameless and fearless. Nothing mattered to me but the revolution. We quickly discovered that the people were more advanced than we thought. They not only contributed generously, but urged us to mobilize others to help canvas the whole city, which we did. The women joined the vanguard. The masses filled our, our coffers. No one, not even official sources, criticized our action. Kuwait City was ready to join the move to social progress. Encouraged by this response, I decided to earn some money for the PF by tutoring in English and by using the talent for hairdressing that I had acquired in Lebanon as a youngster. Without revealing details of my political affiliation, I applied for and got a job 
in a beauty salon for the first two-week Easter vacation. After hours, I worked tirelessly to raise funds for the PF. I seized every opportunity to propagate the cause. One day, an affluent-looking lady who must have been pleased by the hairstyle I gave her gave me a 25 fills tip. I hesitated for a moment, then accepted it, and gave her a receipt for it. The lady was surprised when she saw the stamp of the popular front on it, but she gave me another dinar and wished the PF well. My employer, who had witnessed the exchange, was not angry. She said that she sympathized with the cause because she asked me to keep my politics to myself. Oh, I'm sorry, but she asked me to keep my politics to myself. I was especially careful and courteous in dealing with people, and she said such revolutionary qualities were necessary for Arab women. When I left, she gave me my pay plus a five dinar donation to the PF. The PF was indeed making friends. I was not, however, the happiest of women. The party was making me do this sort of work that I didn't enjoy. I was restless for action. That spring, I said goodbye to teaching and to my Kuwaiti friends. My time had come. I headed for Amman. My Russian name, my Russian made gun, the Sminov, became my companion. I'm sorry. The Seminov, sorry. When I arrived in Amman, the city was swarming with guerrillas. It felt good to be a Palestinian in one's homeland. Within a few days, with 20 women comrades, I was taken to a military camp north of Amman, where we were to undergo more intensive and specialized training. Here, I met the legendary her heroine of our underground in the occupied territory, Rashida Obadeh. She was a truly impressive human being as well as a beautiful woman. She knew how to handle a gun, and she knew when to use it for the cause. I made friends with her, and Faha Abdul El Hadi almost immediately. Before we embarked on a mission to test our endurance, the head of the military school, Comrade Hassan, gave us a final briefing in which he distinguished between mere political agitation and fundraising and political military work. He concluded his speech by saying, this phase of our work is harsh and severe. Once you start it, you can't withdraw until the objective is accomplished. Therefore, he continued, examine your consciousness, comrades, and see if you're really up to it. If not, please depart in peace. Startled, we each looked around and wondered whether we should proceed or withdraw. A three-hour struggle succession followed. Oh, I read that wrong. A three-hour struggle session followed. The argument centered around whether our training was going to be used or whether we were just training for contingencies. We also argued about individuality, the role of women in the movement, and the kind of relationship we were going to have with parents, boyfriends, or husbands. If a woman decided to commit herself to, the, to this phase of the revolution, it meant the final break with her past and relegating her private life and desires to a secondary position. If she was unable to accept these terms, then she could make a partial commitment to become a supporter or a friend of the resistance rather than train to become a professional revolutionary. Those who choose the military option were to remain for further training. The women who thought of the training period as a pleasant summer promenade began to retreat. Rashida and I immediately upbraided the comrade who pointed out that she had no formal permission from her parents to be in the camp. Rashida told her bluntly, Sister, if at 25 you still have to depend on your mother's approval, you do not belong in the popular front. You should go back home and ask your mother to find you a husband and prepare an attractive dowry for you. I was less harsh than Rashida. Look, sisters, Palestine beckons us to redeem her and here we are squabbling among ourselves about parents and families. I think we should overcome this kind of adolescence and act as grown-up women, not as appendages to our men or maids to our parents. I looked Salwa in the eye and said, If you wish to leave, no one will stop you. If you're incapable of acting as a mature and self-determining woman, return home for further training. In the heat of the debate, 
three women collapsed under the pressure and decided they didn't belong in this phase of the work. Comrade Hassan re-entered the tent as the Sunshine Patriots departed. He wished them well. The rest of us hurried to make plans for survival in the arid mountains of Jordan. Night was settling in. The plains and the cities below were our guardians. I was tense. I didn't sleep well that night. Most of us were very on edge for the next few days. Some had misgivings. Others feared the unknown. I realized that at last my dream was coming true and overcame my tenseness. I had no time for prolonged doubt or fright. I had lived that agonizing period months before. I was ready for action. Action was forthcoming, but not in the expected form. On the third night of our stay in the mountains, a comrade guard was nervously watching for Zionist infiltrators and walking gingerly when she heard a strange sound. She was ordered the infiltrator to stop and identify himself. He didn't. She fired into the darkness. In seconds, everyone in the camp was crawling on their stomachs in search of the enemy. Salufa, or Salufa, continued firing as we zeroed in on, on the target, knowing that if she killed one intruder, at least two or three others must be at large in the vicinity. We quickly found out that there were none and that the comrade guard had indeed scored. She had killed a donkey invader. <laughs> we had a brief meeting and decided to pay the owners of the donkey the required price, but no one ever claimed the poor wanderer, wandering beast. A few days later, the donkey affair, or a few days after the donkey affair, there were no jokes. Our intelligence relayed a message that the Israelis were planning to bomb our camp at 5 a.m. on June 5th to celebrate the second anniversary of the June War. At 3 a.m., I had just returned from maneuvers and wanted to catch an hour or two of sleep. But Comrade Basim ordered us to depart immediately and made preparations to move out heavy equipment. It so happened that we were being visited that evening by a group of Iraqi artists who wanted to live the revolution and witness the work of revolutionaries. The comrade artists had their fill that night as they joined our column's march in darkness. At the appointed time, the Israeli bombers swooped over the area, dropped their flares and bombs without being challenged, and turned the early morning sunshine into a blinding column of smoke. They strafed the whole region for several minutes with their hell of iron and destruction, and then returned home safely. We were helpless. Hussein's Air Force was on the ground, it was not intended to use to use against the Israelis, but against the Palestinians who didn't own a single civilian plane. The world's press reported the incidents as Israelis' recognizance and termed the second anniversary of the June War peaceful. We returned to camp, rebuilt it in a few days, and resumed our preparations to confront the Zionist enemy. At camp, I did my utmost to prove that I was fit to be a good guerrilla fighter. I carried out orders conscientiously. My, instructor, my instructors offered no criticism, expressed no admiration, and had no particular plan for me. I knew that the PF leadership would take my personal desires into consideration, but would decide what missions I was to undertake on the basis of my potential and performances. The training schedule was exacting, but occasionally left us time for a little fun. We were entertaining a group of foreign students and trying to lead a abundant kind of life in order to politicize our population. The students have been attending a an international solidarity meeting in autumn or in Amman, held under the auspices of the General Union of Palestinian Students. Most were graduates of the 1968 University Upheavals in the West. We found it very amusing that they honestly believed that they were making revolution if they under, undressed in public and seized the university building or shouted in obscenity at bureaucrats. I was initially opposed and refused to talk to them, even though some believed in violent revolution because I didn't want to be another experimental guinea pig to Westerners. I finally relented, and I'm glad I did. I hadn't met Western revolutionaries before. And she puts revolutionaries in quotes. <laughs> 
it turned out they represented an unfamiliar cultural rather cultural rather than a political phenomenon. Some seem to have read the historic political literature of the left, but most regarded the Marxist-Leninist leaders disdainfully, with the exception of the young Marx, who held some sort of fascination for a few of them. Though we were impressed by their moral integrity and personal dedication, we felt their ideology and strategy had little to do with the making of revolution. Some Americans were quite serious and believed in the historic mission of the working class and were making plans to integrate themselves with the masses. What astonished us most about this group was that they were opposed to nationalism, a doctrine we hold dearly as a colonized and dissipated people. Some believed in violence for the hell of it and in, and in students as revolutionary agents of history. But the majority were inclined towards guerrilla theater as a means of making revolution in quotes. They performed a little, they performed a little for us. Mm. As they were departing, I was rather struck by a French anarchist student who proclaimed, let chaos reign, and by a German who echoed the same sentiment. I exclaimed, 